Well, you can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be finishing out this chapter this morning. Starting in verse 15, but we're going to get a running start and look back a little bit, do a little, little uh, preview or review rather. Before we do that, I want to set us up with an illustration. So you all know, you've heard me enough that one of my big heroes in the faith is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was a preacher of the Metropolitan Baptist Church in England throughout the late 1800s. And, and by the late 1880s, he's the most famous human being in all of England. Everybody knows his name. His church has 4,000 people in it. And his sermons are being printed all across the globe. That Somebody would sit down and write down every word that he said, and then he would review that for editing on Monday, and then it would go out to newspapers, and it would be disseminated from England in the 1800s to the U.S., to Scandinavia, all over Europe, and off into Asia. This is a globally known guy with a huge church and a faithful doctrine. But in the late 1880s, his union, they were, he's in the Baptist Union. He wasn't in the Anglican Church or any other kind of big high, high church denomination. He was in the part of the Baptist Union in England. And his entire denomination was sliding into deep error and even what you could call heresy. They I mean, they're believing stuff like the Scripture isn't inerrant and it's not necessary to even debate that, that we don't need to worry about the deity of Christ or not. We don't need to worry about the virgin birth. Uh, we don't have to worry about or make this big deal about the Trinity or whether sin needed to be atoned for. We just needed kind of a model for holiness. Nobody, we don't need to worry about any of that stuff. The entire Baptist Union is downgrading in what it believes. And so Spurgeon called it, and then historians of this called it afterwards, that this was the downgrade controversy in the late 1800s. And he's the only one standing up against an entire denomination, a country of denomination, and saying, we can't do this. You can't believe this. This is not the God of the Bible. This is not the message of the Bible. This is not the truth. And he is the only voice standing against it. His friends in ministry, other fellow pastors, turn against him and say, get with the times. What are you doing? He had a pastor's college and he would have young men come in from all over and he would find places for them to stay with members in his church. And then he would teach them every day and then send them out in local and small towns to go preach. It was his pastor's college. And he had men who graduated from that turn against him and say, get with the times, Spurgeon. We don't need that kind of thinking anymore. It had its day, but now it's over. And one dissenting voice said this in a, in a newspaper. It was published. It said, it can no longer be concealed that Mr. Spurgeon is out of touch with the new democracy and the younger generation of devout evangelicals. He is standing still, but the church of God moves on. An old-fashioned Puritan formulae are driving him into a reactionary and vanquished camp. Get with the times. You are standing still in the faith of our fathers, and we've moved past that. We don't need that anymore. So we can't conceal it anymore. He's just an old fuddy-duddy. That's who he is. And he stands alone, and eventually he has to withdraw his church from the union. And it made a big old stink because he has the largest church in the union, and everybody thought it was a power play but he was just like, I cannot faithfully do this. I can't say that we believe this and I can't partner with people who are gonna teach others this lie. This is not true. This does not lead to salvation and thus to heaven. And they hated him for it. And he also, throughout his whole, or the end of his adult life, he struggled with a lot of diseases. He had kidney disease, kidney failure frequently. He had gout, which was just arthritis throughout his body. And he even struggled with depression. He would get so depressed at times that his wife would come and find him face down, motionless on the floor in his study. And she would have to pick him up and just to make him eat and get off the ground. I mean, he struggled with lots of these things. And as this controversy is going on, as the 1880s wear on, he wrote this to a friend who said, this fight, this downgrade controversy is killing me. And kill him it did. On January 31st, 1892, he was only 58 years old. He died from the, the stress, the pressure, and from all of these other health complications that he had. But he said this, Danny, I forgot to get you the whole quote, so you're just going to have to wing it again for round two. 
I'm going to read the whole thing. I just brought the whole book. He said this about that time and about that era. He said, we admire a man who was firm in the faith, say, 400 years ago, but such a man today is a nuisance and must be put down. Call him a narrow-minded bigot or give him a worse name if you can think of one. Yet imagine that in those ages past, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and their compeers had said, the world is out of order, but if we try to set it right, we shall only make a great row and get ourselves into disgrace. Let us go to our chambers and put on our nightcaps and sleep over the bad times. And perhaps when we wake up, things will have grown better. Such conduct on their part would have entailed upon us a heritage of error. Age after age would have gone down into the infernal deeps and to the pestiferous bogs of error. That's an SAT word right there, pestiferous. Write that one down. And those bogs of error would have swallowed all. These men loved the faith in the name of Jesus too well to see them trampled on. It is today as it was in the reformers' days. Decision is needed. Here is the day for the man. Where is the man for the day? We who have had the gospel passed to us by martyr hands dare not trifle with it, nor sit by and hear it denied by traitors who pretend to love it, but inwardly abhor every line of it. He said then, if we turn to the right, mayhap our children and our children's children will go that way. But if we turn to the left, generations yet unborn will curse our names for having been unfaithful to God and to his word. That is a leader right there. That is a leader in the face of challenge that I owe it to my grandkids and my great-grandkids and their great-grandkids to stand firm now, to hold the line of the truth now. No matter how ostracized I may be and no matter how isolated I may become, if need be, I will stand alone on the truth. And he said, history is going to have to vindicate me, and it has vindicated him. He stood alone for the truth, and this is the exact message that we talked about last week with Paul to Timothy, right? Verse 14 of chapter 1 in 2 Timothy, he says, guard the good deposit, guard the gospel. He told him that. He told him in verse 11 and 12, he said, I guarantee you that if you are a preacher and teacher of this message, it will lead to suffering. That's a given, so understand that. And then he said, Earlier in verse 8b, the second half of that verse, he says, embrace the suffering. Hold it in. Don't run from it. Embrace that level of suffering for the gospel. Because the fact is, when you're commissioned to guard something, it means that that thing has value. You don't have to guard anything that nobody wants. And you don't have to guard anything that's never going to come under attack. You don't have to guard anything that has no value. But he told Timothy, to guard the good deposit in verse 14. Because that good deposit, the gospel is endlessly under attack. Evil forces, be they supernatural or natural, are constantly, are relentlessly trying to distort the message of the gospel, to commandeer it and turn it into something that is foreign to the New Testament. It is constantly happening. And the gospel message is of highest value and thus, thus worth our highest effort because within the gospel message are the words of life to dying men. And within the gospel message is the steadfast love of God to hostile people. Within the gospel message is the only hope of escaping the righteous wrath of an offended deity. That's in the gospel. And what Satan has done throughout the history of the church is seek to distort the gospel to one extreme or the other to either distort it by narrowing it into something that the New Testament says it is not, or distort it by broadening it into something that the New Testament says it is not. It's gonna try to, he tries to do that throughout the ages through different venues and people in one way or the other. So the way that he narrows it is he adds things to it by saying, hey, if you 
want to believe, you want to be saved, you need to do these things, you need to show up at these times, you need to partake of these rituals, you need to order your life according to these traditions and rules. And if you do all of that, then you will be saved. We can see that in church history. In 1077, Pope Leo VII got crossways with the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV. If you know anything about history, that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. Charles was basically just a German, and he was the biggest, baddest guy on the block, so he got to be the boss. And he got crossways with the Pope in 1077. And according to Catholic doctrine, if you aren't taking the Mass every single week, you are not accruing grace. So I have to come and take what we call communion, or the Lord's Sable, every single week. And if I'm cut off from that, then my grace is diminishing and I am sliding into hell. So when, when Pope Leo gets crossways with King Charles, he excommunicates Charles from the church. He kicks him out, cuts him off from the mass. Nobody can, no priest anywhere can give him the mass. And thus, if you cut off the king, you cut off all of his people. So in his mind, and in, according to his doctrine, he has condemned an entire country to hell because he got crossways with their boss. And so in order to restore that relationship, he makes King Charles come all the way to Canosa, Italy, up in the mountains, stand in the snow for three days straight to pay penance for what he's done. You just stand out there and pray and weep and maybe I'll forgive you and thus give you back the means of grace so you can get to heaven and also your people as well. He humiliates him with the gospel. And then he says this, he wrote, we loosed the chain of anathema and at length received him. Anathema means cursed to hell into the lap of the Holy Mother Church. After a little while, we finally gave it back and now his people can start working their way to heaven again. That's narrowing. That's weaponizing the gospel. That's taking it into something that it's not and turning it into a weapon. But Satan has also been in the business of broadening the definitions of the gospel. That anybody, anywhere who has genuine religious feelings, whether it's capital G God, little G God, and they're semi-respectful and or warm, favorable, whatever you'd say, to Jesus in some way, then you're good. Then that's, that's saving faith. That gets you out of hell. Just kind of fuzziness towards Jesus and an acceptability or an acknowledgement that God exists in some way. That, that's also been his scheme throughout the years. And I'll tell you a recent one that's popped up. Bishop Karen Olivetto of the United Methodist Church, she's bishop over what they call the Sky Region. So it's Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and a part of Idaho. And she is a married lesbian woman who used to pastor a 12,000-member church in San Francisco. And she said, in reference to Matthew 15, when Jesus has the interaction with the Canaanite woman, and she says, please heal my daughter, cast the demon out of her. And Jesus says, no, I can't. I'm not gonna do that right now. I came only to the children of the house. And she says, yes, but even the, child, the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall off the children's table. And he says, I've never seen faith like that in anyone here. Go and your daughter is gonna be healed. So we view that as a testing of her faith. She came for a handout. Jesus wanted to see, does she have real faith? And she persists. And Jesus grants that faith. That's how we See that story, but that's not how Bishop Karen Olivedo interprets that story. She said this about that. She said, Jesus wasn't a know-it-all. He was also learning God's will like any human being. And finally, he changed his mind, Jesus. If Jesus could grow into a new and deeper understanding through openness to God's people, maybe if Jesus can change his mind, then maybe so can we. That's what she says about Jesus. But she's not done. She says, if Jesus can change, if Jesus can give up his bigotries and prejudices, if he can realize that he made his life too small, and if in his realization he grew closer to others and closer to God, then so can we. I feel like I need to take a bath after just reading that. The Jesus, the God of the universe that John 1 and Colossians 1 says he created all things and is fully God can learn something? 
was born a bigot with prejudices. That's what this bishop, this woman said, and she's over and in charge of 400 churches in the United Methodist Church in the United States right now. And that's where you end up when you broaden the gospel to be anything you want it to be. That as long as you have and acknowledge that Jesus was somebody at some point and that there is a God, then you're good. That that's where you, so that's not weaponizing the gospel. That's turning the gospel into a neurotoxin and pouring it into the world's water supply and everybody who drinks it dies. Because that Jesus doesn't save you from eternal condemnation and that God is not holy and perfect. So we do labor in this fight and we do expect to be shot at from the enemy. That anybody who stands for the true gospel as it given to us in the New Testament will come under fire from the other side. And Timothy needed to be fully aware of that, did he not? And doesn't Paul say that to him in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, when he says, wage the good warfare? He doesn't say, attend the good picnic. He doesn't say, take the good nap. He says, wage the good warfare. My dad told me, he's like, Stuart, if you're gonna engage in gospel ministry, told me this years ago, if you're gonna engage in gospel ministry, then you need to expect to be shot at from the enemy because you have placed yourself on the front lines. And that's true for all Christians. If you are going to hold to the Bible as written, then don't panic when bullets start flying by your head because that's what you signed up for. That's what the nature of the gospel message is and holding to it will incur from the enemy. That is what is gonna happen. We, the gospel will be relentlessly attacked until the Lord finally returns and vanquishes all opposition and sets up his eternal reign in a new heaven and a new earth. And Timothy needed to be prepared to stand alone. So Paul's building him up to by verse 14, you need to be prepared to stand alone if that's what it takes. And brothers and sisters, you need to be prepared to stand alone if that's what it takes. You won't stand alone as long as you're a member of this church, but you may have to stand alone at your workplace. You may have to stand alone in your neighborhood, or on your little league team, or on your own softball team. You may have to stand alone in a lot of different places. And what he's telling Timothy needs to be told to us too. Are you willing to guard the good deposit because somebody is trying to commandeer it and to warp it? And Paul told Timothy to guard it. What does it say in verse 14? Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Exactly how you got this gospel, that's exactly how you need to preserve it. As is presented to you, so do you guard it. You don't get to change it. And that's why God gave us an immovable standard. That's why he gave us a Bible because you and I are weak and flawed and you and I can get clouded and confused, but an immovable standard cannot. No matter how long it exists, no matter how long Jesus tarries before he comes again, this will not change, this will not move. So that's why we have this and that's why we guard it as such. We needed a set of propositional truths not the opinions or the good ideas of men and women. And we have that, so we guard it as is. And it's in this context that Paul's going to finish chapter one. He's gonna finish this by saying, here are examples of two camps of people who are unwilling to guard the gospel as entrusted and one person in the camp who was faithful to guard the gospel as was entrusted. So let's look at that, look at verse 15. Verse 15, he says, you are aware that all who were in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So that first phrase, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. So Paul in his darkest hour has an entire group of people abandon him. That's what turned away means. It means deserted or abandoned. They bailed on him. So who are these people? They're, they're all in Asia, but w- w- who are they? Well, what Paul calls Asia is not what we call Asia. Asia was a province in Turkey. So the west coast of Turkey, as it moves towards Greece, there's a province there, like a state, called Asia in the first century world. So an entire province 
has turned against Paul. And Ephesus is the capital of the leading city of that province. So everybody there, Paul says, has turned away from me. And Paul is the one who brought them that gospel. Acts 19.10 tells us how that happened. In Acts 19.10, he says, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So the writer of Acts, Luke, says that everybody in that state heard the gospel. There was a massive awakening, apparently, to the gospel in Asia, that province, in Acts 19, verse 10. But then this great awakening is followed by a great defection because 2 Timothy 1 says, all of them have turned away from me. And whether he's using hyperbole or not, it's still a massive defection that have gone away from him. And why do they desert Paul? They loved this present world. They were unwilling to guard the gospel and they were ashamed of Paul and the gospel that he affirmed. What do we do with that? What do we do when people do that to us? We have an answer. 1 John 2, 19 says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they all are not of us. Apostle John said, that's going to happen. And when they leave, you will then know that they were not ever of us. That's what's happening to Paul in this very moment. So when carrying the gospel, ministry gets even harder. Paul is abandoned by people who are supposed to be his brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. See, we need other Christians in this life, amen? That's how God's rigged it. He's rigged it that we are a body. We are not a confederacy for Christ, we are the body of Christ. See, a body is interdependent and codependent upon all the other members of the body. Everything needs everything else or else it's not a body. So a body is not a federation of individual and independent units. It is an inherently woven together and interdependent. So you can't just put down a liver and a spinal cord and some feet bones and eyes and then call that a body, all these parts. They're not a body until they're congealed together. They're exchanging cells. The same blood pumps through every nook and cranny of it and it gets directives from the same head. That's a body. That's what we are. So when someone leaves us, it hurts. When something that's inside your body that is not a part of your body like a growth or like cancer, has to be removed, it hurts. It gets pulled out and it hurts. But was it merely Paul who they had abandoned? Place yourself in the context. First century church, AD 67, were they leaving Paul because, uh, Paul sees him a little bit hard-lined? We want to go down to the other church down the street. Well, he's in Ephesus in the first century. There is no other church. There are no other options. So leaving Paul, abandoning and deserting him is tantamount to abandoning the gospel message and thus the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because if somebody, if we see people today leave or or, or church leader be forsaken by a bunch of people, it's not necessarily related to the truth of their message, right? The veracity or the in correctness of their message is not necessarily the reason that all the people left. They can leave for a lot of reasons. Well, I didn't like that he wore a suit or I don't really like, you know, I didn't like the way the music sounded or I didn't like the direction the church was going or I wanted to do this children's program, but we did another one. People leave for a lot of reasons that aren't necessarily related to the gospel. But in Paul's context, the only reason they would be leaving is they no longer want to identify with the gospel message as presented in the New Testament because there's nowhere else to go. It's not like they go into Paul's church or a church that Paul planted and that Timothy now pastors in Ephesus and goes, I don't really like the music here. I'm gonna go down the street to the other church that has music that I do like. There is no other church. There is no other option. You are abandoning the truth if you're doing that. The God of the Bible, his son, Jesus Christ, and the message of the gospel. That's the only one way to interpret this. And then he goes on in verse 15. He says, among whom are Phygelus, and Hermogenes, 
We got any phygelises or homogenies in here? No, I mean, this is the only place they're ever mentioned in all of Scripture. We don't know anything about these guys except for what is said right here. But can you imagine? Let's, just, let's contextualize this a little bit just for fun. What if this was a blog post or a Facebook post or a magazine article? Can you imagine the comment section below this? How dare you, Paul? You don't know their hearts. You don't know who Phygelus and Hermogenes. You don't know what they're struggling with. You don't know what they're going through. You're not Jesus. Hey, you got a log in your own eye there, Paul? Judge not, lest you be judged. You're gossiping about Phygelus and Hermogenes, Paul. Well, if you don't like the way he treats Phygelus and Hermogenes, then don't keep reading. Because in chapter two, he's gonna get to Hymenaeus and Philetus. Chapter three, he's gonna get to Janus and Jambres. And chapter four, he's gonna get to Demas and Alexander. Two guys in every chapter that Paul says, they're done. So we need to reckon with this, that this happened in our New Testament. But let's let back up for a minute. If we're to believe that the, all of the Bible is infallible and inerrant and proceeds from the very being of God, he breathes it out. And 2 Timothy 3.16 demands that we believe that. If that's true, then that means that God desired these two names to be enshrined forever in the pages of our Bibles as men who defected from the truth. God wanted that. He intended that to have them forever known as defectors from the truth. And that's why none of your kids are named that. Because that's what God intended and we got the message. But people hate this today. How can you say that? We've been shouted at for decades now, for, since the beginning of the church, but specifically in our context, we've been shouted at Jesus included everyone. Jesus didn't come and he was accepting of all people. Your doctrine divides and what we need is unity. Jesus didn't come. He didn't say get hung up on all the details. He just came and spread his love everywhere and you're not being true to who real Jesus is by drawing these hard lines. But, before we delve into that any further, let's be clear, we should all want unity. Absolutely, we should all want and we should pursue unity, but never at the expense of the truth. Jesus prays in his high priestly prayer the night before he dies in John chapter 17, he says about his disciples to the Father in verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me, that they may be one even as we are one. So his prayer for the church the night before he dies is make them as one unit as the Trinity is. Make them so intertwined and interconnected that you can't understand the part without the whole and the whole without the part. Make them like us, God. That's his prayer. That's, you can't get any more unified than the Trinity. That was his prayer. But then he goes on to say in the same prayer, six verses down in John 17, 17, he says, Lord, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We can only have unity around the truth. There is no unity without the truth. And nothing can more largely promote unity with the truth than breaking with the false and making the false known to be so. But let's also be clear that while we absolutely seek unity, what did our Jesus actually say about his coming? What did he really say? If you go to Matthew 10, he says something that most of us don't like. Matthew 10, verse 32, he says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. Did you hear that in your Bible? Do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That is out of the mouth of the Son of God. So we have to reckon with this. And who is this Jesus of the Bible that we say that we know? That he says, you, you proclaim me before men, I'll proclaim you before my Father. But let's be clear that if there comes a division within your own household even, between you and your parents or you and your brothers and sisters or between you and your children, you side with me. True believers side with me over their closest relationships and that inherently brings division because your ultimate allegiance as those who will be saved must be to Jesus and no one else. And that inherently brings division. That's why we have so much friction with our world because the, the world has said, this is bad and this is good and we're saying, you're wrong, we're going to align with Jesus. And they hate us for it. There's always been this undercurrent throughout church history uh, for these ecumenical efforts. You know what I mean when I say ecumenical? Ecumenical, just think of it as church unity across all denominations, different backgrounds, belief systems, and all these things. Let's get everybody together. Let's all be one. Let's all get together and be ecumenical. But we have to ask questions like this. Should we unite with a church that doesn't believe that you are saved until you get baptized? Do we unite with them? Do we, should we unite with a church that says, no, you do need to do good works in order to help synergize and earn your salvation? Should we unite with a church that says, God is not Trinity, he is singular? There's several denominations like that. Do, do we unite with them? What about a church that sings only psalms in Gregorian chants? Do we unite with them? Some of those things, yeah, we can hang out with you. Some of those things, no, we cannot. We cannot tell a lost and dying world that what they have is the truth also. We have responsibility in that sense. Because do we unite with churches that are going to say sincere and genuine Hindus and Muslims and pagans will end up going to heaven because they're sincere? Do we unite with them? We have to answer these questions. We have to wrestle with these and think through these things because in any cooperative or in any union, those who join inherently have to give up beliefs and convictions that they've, hold, that they've held, right? Just think about it in a simplistic way. Think about your HOA, your neighborhood. You gave up lots of rights and things that you believe. I believe firmly that it doesn't bother anybody or damage anyone if my trash can stays at the curb weeks on end. But the HOA says, nope, you gotta pull it up. And I, I gave up that right. I, have, I knew of a guy who he had this crazy lawn practice where he would torch his yard, burn it all the way every couple of years. And it made this lush, it just was, it was like this ancient primitive landscaping technique, but his grass would always come back just thick and full and beautiful. But no HOA is gonna let you start a bonfire for your own yard, even though when it grows back, everybody's property value is gonna go up because that yard looks like an emerald. So that deeply held conviction that you know to be true and know to be a blessing to everybody involved, you have to lay aside because you joined a group. So we have to be careful with who we're gonna join with and who we're gonna confirm because eventually in these ecumenical type gatherings, so many critical doctrines are silenced for the greater good of the gospel. But eventually you end up with something that they call the gospel that is neither great nor good. And it saves no one. Spurgeon said in, in the moment of that downgrade controversy, he said, it is our solemn conviction that where there can be no real spiritual communion, there should be no presence of fellowship. Fellowship with known and vital error is participation in sin. So then if we can't unite with them, all of them, then we're gonna have to say that at some point. And that's not gossip, but it is making a statement. It is making a statement to a watching world as Paul made to Timothy do not associate anymore with Phygelus and Hermogenes because they no longer have the true gospel. Because that's the, we can no longer confirm to a watching world that they have the truth, and that makes a statement. But you know what makes perhaps an even louder and more profound statement? Consistent living with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's where Paul's going to end up in this chapter. 
is with this brother Onesiphorus. Look at chapter 1, verse 16. He says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. Paul had been deserted by everyone in Asia except for one guy, Onesiphorus. And we learn later in the passage that he's from, he's from Ephesus. Timothy knows this brother. He was deserted by everybody except for one guy. Jesus knew the complete and full abandonment and desertion of people who said to be with him, right? And one of them even went so far to say this in his darkest hour, he went so far to say, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And in that very same one in Luke's account, Peter said, or Jesus is said to have seen and locked eyes with Peter right after he said, I do not know him. Jesus knew complete and utter abandonment in his darkest hour. At least Paul had one guy. Paul had Onesiphorus, this brother who comes to Rome. He's not from Rome, but he gets on a boat or makes this crazy long land journey, either way he went, and gets to Rome, and there's no GPS. Type in prison and then follow it to get to the prison. He's got to get there and go, hey, where's the jail? And people who aren't in jail probably don't know where this jail is. So he's having to search all over to find where Paul is in prison. So he's talking and asking people, I'm looking for the jail. I'm looking for the jail. Why are you looking for the jail? Because my friend is there. He's publicly identifying with Paul. Well, why do you care so much about him? Because in these days, there wasn't a prison system where you have rights and people care about you and you get to go outside, you have a bathroom. Things like that aren't in Paul's jail. So if nobody comes and feeds him, he just dies of starvation. So he's like, I got to feed him. Why do you care about keeping that guy alive? Obviously, what he did was wrong. No, I, I, he told me the gospel, the truth of the gospel. And he's, he's ministered to me. I, I want to serve and, and be there for him. So he's publicly identifying with this guy. And then remember in verse 8 of that very same chapter, 1 Timothy 2, he tells Timothy, don't be ashamed of my chains. What does he say of Onesiphorus? Who was not ashamed of my chains. He wasn't embarrassed to identify with this religious nut job who got locked up. And then he's got to go to the jail over and over because what does it say? He often refreshed me. So he keeps coming with things. And Paul needs stuff. At the end of 2 Timothy, he says, hey, bring a coat because I'm freezing in here. And they're not going to give me one. So he needs things. And Onesa first is bring it to him, coming regularly to the jail. You can imagine conversations that he might have had with jailers. Hey, who are you here to see? Oh, I'm here to see Paul. That, that crazy religious dude that everybody says, like, hey, let's just cut his head off and get done with him. You want to see that guy? Yeah, that's the guy I'm here to see. I'm bringing him food. Why, are you, why do you even care about keeping him alive? You're okay. You're fine. Just go on. Well, I mean, this is what he told me about the gospel, and I believed, and then this is what the Jesus that I believed in and said to do. Well, who is this Jesus? He's got to identify with Christ because he's identifying with Paul. And he, people are, he's got to go through venues. It's not like he's just throwing food over the wall. He's got to come and minister to him. He refreshed him. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 18, he says, may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So Timothy knows this brother. He's well known in Ephesus. People in the church know who Onesiphorus is. They get it. This regular guy didn't write a lick of scripture. Nothing else really said about him about the New Testament. But you know him. You know what he's done. You know his reputation. But did you notice that first phrase of verse 18 that Paul prays for him? Does that sound weird? It says in verse 18, may the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. So Paul, his prayer for Onesiphorus is, God, let him find mercy from you on that day. It's not like Nehemiah. Nehemiah, what's his prayer when he's going to go before King Artaxerxes of Persia? He says, God, grant me favor before this king. But Paul's prayer is, God, grant him favor before you. It sounds kind of backwards that Paul wants God to intervene between Onesiphorus and God. That to this kind of interworking thing. Has God established, we ask this question when you read this verse, has God established 
a way for himself to intervene between sinners and himself. Has he, has he made that way true? Look at 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate. Someone speaking on our behalf. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able, meaning Jesus, to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we have an advocate who's making intercessions. And then 1 Timothy 1, 2, or 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So we have an advocate who is also a mediator who's making intercessions. And then Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? who indeed is interceding for us. So the New Testament puts forth this picture of Jesus, which is also true of the Holy Spirit, interceding for us. But Jesus, second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, eternally God and equal with God, in essence and in being, he is the one who is our advocate, our mediator, who's constantly interceding for us. So in the cosmic trial that you and I are on for treason against the king of the universe, God is our judge and our returning. He's the lawyer and the guy with the gavel. He's both. Isn't that insane? Who, who would take our case? You're absolutely dead to rights. You are dead in your sins. You are guilty. What lawyer says, yeah, I want to do that. I want to try that case before a perfect, all-seeing, all-knowing judge. The only one who can take that case and come away successful would be that all-seeing, all-knowing, perfect judge. So God takes your case and argues it to God. So Paul's prayer for, for Onus at first here is Trinitarian, that he's exalting the glories of God in our salvation, that we lean not on our own abilities to make a case before God, that God makes the case for us to himself within his own person. Does that blow your mind? This is unbelievable Trinitarian truth here. That, that Paul's prayer is that Onesiphorus, his, his faith, his hope for eternity lays on Christ. And so then Christ, as his advocate, as his attorney, goes before the judge and says, my payment, my righteousness covers him. And then the judge goes, that works. I'll count you righteous, Onesiphorus, on that day, capital D, judgment day, because you stand not on your own merit, but you stand behind Christ and his merit, and he is my son, and he is me, and we are one. That's the inner workings of happening. What happens when you repent and believe the gospel? Isn't that unbelievable? And that's what Paul ends with. It just drops that theology nugget at the end of a chapter for us to just ponder and mull over the goodness of God in the midst of suffering. That it's not up to me and, and me even really suffering well. I must be engaged in that, but it's still gonna be God intervening between me and God himself. That's, that's how it's all gonna work out. That's how it has worked out in past tense. If you have believed, you are justified, declared, not made, but declared righteous for all who believe in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther in 1521, he gets put on trial in front of the papal authorities, the, the authorities of the Catholic Church, because he was teaching that very truth, that we stand not in our own righteousness, we're not accruing uh, righteousness to these means of grace, that we are justified, that faith alone in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, is what leads us to salvation. That's what leads us to being justified. So he's on trial for believing and teaching that. And they ask him to recant. You gotta deny this. And he says, if you can show me another way in the Bible, then I'll deny it. So, of course, they, they don't. They don't engage in that. They're not going to entertain that. So when he's about to be sentenced, his concluding remarks, when he's before these people who really want to see him dead and, and got pretty close of achieving that, he says, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. 
Here is what I see to be true in the Bible. Here is the good deposit that's been entrusted to me that I'm trying to guard. I stand on this alone. I can't do anything else. God help me because nobody else is going to. And brothers and sisters, we got to be willing to do that as well. To stand on the word of God alone. That we preach the salvation that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that faith placed in Jesus Christ. Belief that he is the son of God who paid their debt and he's Lord over their lives. And asking God to cover them with, their own, with his righteousness. An alien righteousness that is not inherent within us but must come from without us. We preach that gospel. We stand alone, if need be, for that gospel, for the glory of God alone, forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for a regular guy like Onesiphorus who stood strong on the truth and did not waver and did not bat an eye, but identified with your spokesman, and that period of redemptive history and thus the message that we still proclaim and we still cling to today. Thank you. Thank you for regular people who fight the good fight and who seek to finish the race. Or let us be like that. Teach us to be like that through your Bible. Teach us to, to question every preconceived notion that we have and line it up against the Bible. That the Bible would be our standard for faith and practice for how we live, for how we make decisions, for how we do all things, because it alone is immovable and inerrant. And we are flawed and we are clouded. We can be confused, but you are not and you have never been. And in your pure clarity, knew and understood and ordained that we would never be able to earn our way to you, but so you sent us a mediator. You sent us an advocate to argue our case that we place our faith in him and we can be saved. It's an absurd gift that we could never deserve, but we thank you, we worship you for it. Or be rightly worshiped by us now as we sing, and be rightly worshiped by us as we go forth and live our lives according to this truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.